This program is brought to you by Agnes Scott College. For more information about Agnes Scott College, please visit our website at agnesscott.edu. And many thanks to David D'Ambrosio for that beautiful music. It is my great pleasure to welcome all of you on this beautiful day to Agnes Scott's annual Founders Day Convocation. We are celebrating the 123rd anniversary of the founding of Agnes Scott College. And it's truly wonderful to see students, faculty, staff, retired faculty and staff, alumni, parents, special guests, who are gathered here today. Each year, the college celebrates its founding on a date close to February 22nd, Colonel George Washington Scott's birthday. As an elder of Decatur Presbyterian Church and a member of its session, Colonel Scott was a charter supporter of the church's efforts to establish a school for women, the Decatur Female Seminary. He went on to donate funds for the purchase of land and the construction of the school's first building, still standing and beautiful, Main Hall, and asked that the school be renamed in honor of his late mother, Agnes Irvine Scott, an Irish immigrant whose tartan I proudly wear today. <laughs> Since 1918, Agnes Scott has celebrated Founders Day as an opportunity to look back in gratitude on all those who have made today's Agnes Scott possible, from Colonel Scott and the Reverend Frank Gaines to other great leaders, teachers, and benefactors over the years. Their generosity and vision continues to inspire us today. And I want to extend a warm welcome today to the members of the Scott family who are with us. We are so fortunate to have your continued friendship, commitment, and support. So I'd like to ask all of the members of the Scott family if you would rise so that we can welcome and thank you. Indeed, it was a year ago to, uh, at this occasion on Founders Day that we dedicated our splendid Betty Pope Scott Noble Class of 44 College Heritage Center on the second floor of McCain Library, a gift from the Reverend Dr. Phil Noble and his family. And I know I speak for all of us uh, at the college uh, in expressing our gratitude for this wonderful resource of source of inspiration, a resource for understanding the history of Agnes Scott, and an inspiration for continued efforts to gather uh, memorabilia and information about the, about the college. And I'm thrilled, I just had an opportunity to, to talk to Dr. Julia Scott here, that we, uh, we will have a new addition to the collection of Colonel George Washington Scott's saddle which is apparently in a car right, right by <laughs> campus today. So we're, we're very excited about that. Thank you so much. Please join me also in extending a very warm welcome to uh, President Emerita, wonderful, wonderful leader of Agnes Scott, Dr. Mary Brown Bullock. Mary, if you will stand. It's, it's always such a pleasure to, to see you. This year, Founders Day falls just before Sophomore Family Weekend, and so tomorrow we will celebrate another great Agnes Scott tradition, the Sophomore Ring Ceremony, and members of the class of 2014 will receive their black rings of power, their Agnes Scott rings. So I would like to take a moment to welcome and recognize, and if you would stand if you belong to any of these groups, the SGA Executive Board, members of the Student Senate, members of our Parents Council, and if you are a parent of a sophomore, if you would also stand. <laughs> A very busy weekend because then on Sunday we will welcome a record number of prospective members of the class of 2016 and their families for Scholars Weekend. Over 150 students from 24 states who will visit our campus and interview for scholarships. And so this weekend, Founders Day, 
sophomore ring ceremony and uh, Scholars Weekend makes visible that magical connection of past, present, and future that is at the heart of a great institution of learning like Agnes Scott. We are called to reflect anew on the bold vision of educating and empowering women and of creating a liberal arts institution second to none, which animated the college's founders. And in so doing, we also honor one of the goals of a liberal education to cultivate an understanding of the past. We're also called to be attentive to the development of the wonderful young women who are today's Scotties and to celebrate their personal and intellectual journeys as we will do at tomorrow's sophomore ring ceremony. And as Colonel Scott himself would have wanted, we are called to envision the future and to consider how best to sustain our core mission in this dynamic global society of the 21st century. So welcome. It's now my pleasure to ask the Reverend Kate Calusi Estes, Agnes Scott's Julia Thompson Smith Chaplain, to give our invocation. And then following our invocation, Soto Voce, our student vocal ensemble, will perform a special musical selection, The Nightingale, as well as their signature piece, a musical rendition of the college's motto, Add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge. Chaplain Kate. This time we gather to remember where we have come from, our history and our heritage, who we are and whose we are. So if you would, join me in prayer. God of compassion, as we celebrate this early taste of spring, we are reminded of the upheaval and change that surrounds us. We are thrilled and tempted by the gentle spring breezes, but we're reminded also that spring is a time of strong winds and mighty storms, and many of us are anxious in the face of the coming storm. It serves to remind us that we seek the peace that passes all understanding. There were those among that great cloud of witnesses who saw your hand at work and the light of your spirit in the women around them. They saw the importance of the place for women to work and learn, and study to live as equals in the world and be engaged in it as all those around them. We thank you today for their hard choices and the chances they took. Without their commitment to the education of women, we would not be here today. We celebrate all those who have given of themselves, of their lives and their labors, to nurture this place and to help us grow and prosper. For the promise of what is yet to come, we thank you. We are reminded that in all things, you are made new, and we try to live that promise the best way that we know how. For your many gifts, we cannot be more thankful, and we hope that our gratitude is evident. Help us to remember that you are at work, even now, bringing healing to the world, for all of us, remind us that healing might have already started all around us, and we may not yet recognize it in the moment. By your grace, amen.
absolutely splendid. Thank you. It's now my great pleasure to introduce our convocation speaker, Dr. David L. Warren. At a time of great challenge and change in higher education, I truly believe there is no other person more perfectly suited to deliver our Founders Day address than David. For the past two decades, he has served as an eloquent, tireless, and tenacious advocate for independent colleges and universities as president of NICU, the National Association of Independent Colleges and Universities. NICU represents the interests of our sector of higher education on federal policy issues, and David's been at the forefront of important arguments and struggles over important issues, student aid, taxation, government regulation, and many more. He also served for nearly a decade as president of Ohio Wesleyan University, and we have been blessed over the past eight years to have him serve as an Agnes Scott trustee. And in fact, I've gotten quite used to that look of green envy that comes over the face of, an, of another college president when I mention that David is a member of our board. His illustrious career includes academic and administrative positions at Antioch College and Yale University, a Fulbright Scholarship in India, a Rockefeller Fellowship at Yale, as well as a stint in city government as the Chief Administrative Officer of New Haven, Connecticut. David Warren knows and loves Agnes Scott. He is a wise and passionate advocate of a liberal arts education, and he's also uniquely positioned to understand the challenges we face today in today's political, economic, and social climate. So drawing on his own journey as a student, teacher, and leader, he will offer reflections on the enduring value of the liberal arts, as well as the imperatives for innovation and change in higher education today. His address, Life Chances, Choices, and the Liberal Arts, Reflections from a Child of the Manhattan Project. Please join me in welcoming Dr. David Warren. Thank you so very much, Elizabeth, for that generous introduction. I'm certain that many of you are puzzling about the title, and in due course, I'll try to um, unravel it for you. But I want you to know, as Elizabeth and I talked about this convocation event, and I said to her, I'm flattered and honored to be invited, I said, you know, I think what I don't want to do is give a kind of Phi Beta Kappa speech on the liberal arts. I've given those, and others here in this room have too. But I said, there's something else on my mind. And I wanted to think a little bit about the impact of liberal arts learning on my life and my work, and to see it through the optic of a set of perhaps unusual experiences. And so it partly accounts for the title. And I thought maybe the place to begin is at the beginning. Uh, I am a child of the Manhattan Project. Manhattan Project, I think most of you know, was a top secret decision by President Franklin D. Roosevelt to build the world's first atomic bomb. It was a decision urged upon him by Albert Einstein, a number of scientists, and the intelligence wing of the United States Army. And the argument advanced was that Nazi Germany was seeking to build an atomic bomb. And if they succeeded before the United States did, that we would most certainly lose the Second World War. So Roosevelt set in motion a $1 billion entirely secret project valued today at $24 billion. And he set about using key agents to identify three places where the research, the design 
of the nuclear reactors and the building of the bomb might take place. The most famous of these is Los Alamos, New Mexico. Many people associate that with where the atomic bomb was built. The least known is a place called Oak Ridge, Tennessee. But the place where the bomb was built that was dropped on Nagasaki was something obscure called Hanford, Washington. Hanford, Washington was a little farming village of 250 people. But it was located in this giant desert part of the southeast corner of the state of Washington. It was a desert filled with jackrabbits, tumbleweeds, coyotes. And this tract of land abutted the Columbia River. And the decision was to pick this location because it was not clear that in the building of the bomb, they might, in fact, set it off. And they needed to be in a space so wide and so uninhabited as to save as many lives as possible. So they cordoned off 640 square miles in the desert. And they began the construction of the first nuclear reactor. Now my father at the time was a chemical engineer, an expert in black powder, a second lieutenant in the Army Reserve. And he was approached by the FBI and also by the Army and they asked him this question. They said, would you be willing to be part of a major effort to save democracy. But we can't tell you what it is or where you will have to go to be part of it. And he said, I will do that. They said, not so fast. We have to put you through a security check. He said, fine. About four days later, they came back and they said to him, we regret to report you failed the security test. <laughs> he said, uh, could you tell me why? He said, yes, apparently you beat your wife. <laughs> My father was stunned. My mother was angry. And my father had an inkling of what was really happening. He said, now, my name is James Hubert Warren. And I grew up in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. There's also a James Harrison Warren, and you might just want to check his file. They came back shamefaced, full of apologies, but still not willing to tell him what it was he was signing on to and where he and the family were going. So they put us on a train and they aimed it from the east coast to the west. And it wasn't until the the last day that the Army intelligence took him aside and said, you're going to be part of what's known as the Manhattan Project. And you're going to be one of the engineers that helps build this bomb. You may not utter a word to your wife, to your friends, or to your family. He said, all right. So we arrived, and where we arrived was this dust bowl in the midst of the construction of a town where he and the others, who were scientists, who were theoreticians, who were physicists, would live. And this was a utopian community. The Army built every physical structure, every house, every school, every church, the hospital, the parks, 
and you were assigned where you would live based on the importance of the role you would play. And the houses went from A to G. And my father was stunned to discover he was in a G house. He said, they must think I know more than I know. But he began this quite extraordinary piece of work, getting up every morning before the sun came up, getting on a bus, driving out into the desert, now identified by 640 square miles of fencing, planes running back and forth, dogs, soldiers. And he and his colleagues began the construction of what's now known as the B reactor. The town of Richland was built in a way that no other community, as I know, has ever been built. Not only were all of the physical structures built by the federal government, but every family had its own house and a green lawn. In this town, there was not a single felony crime three years running with a population of 25,000 or more. Why? You couldn't live there unless you'd passed the security test. <laughs> there was not a single unemployed person in this town. 0.00. .00. Why? You couldn't live in this town unless you worked for the Manhattan Project or you were in a support role, teaching in schools, ministering at a church, running a small pharmacy. But when you lived there, every letter in and every letter out had to be read. The security was so tight that you had to have permission to leave the town. And so, while the husbands, and this is an important point, unhappily only one woman was part of the team where my father was in the lead. Nonetheless, these women who were the wives were extraordinarily well educated. My mother was an example. She had a degree in psychology and anthropology. She was smart. She was organized. She was feisty. <laughs> she went to a women's college. She went to Meredith College in Raleigh, North Carolina, and my father had gone to North Carolina State. The women turned their extraordinary energies and intellects on to building this town into a place where every person who lived there would benefit. The schools, as you might guess, were extraordinary, especially in the sciences. But the women particularly said, we've got to have arts, we've got to have humanities, we need English and history, we need sociology, we need, if you will, a liberal arts curriculum. And by the by, when my class graduated, 92% went on to college, seven became valedictorians of their institutions. So they had turned their attention on to the schools. They created an extraordinary symphony orchestra. They built the Richland Playhouse. They made it a city beautiful. And all the while, the husbands were out on the project doing what only they knew about while the women were building this extraordinary place. So the time came when, as we graduated, I needed to think about where I might go. And I knew a lot about Stanford, and I knew about um, Reed College, and thought that these might be places that would be challenging and interesting. But I had this deep interest in English urged on me by my older sister, Dorothy, who went on to get her doctorate in English and caused my brother and I to do the same in our own disciplines. But she said, 
if you've got to pick a discipline, pick English. And I picked Washington State University, to the surprise of many people. This is one of those kinds of decisions that uh, drive admissions officers crazy. <laughs> I went there because it had a great track team. And I was a, <laughs> I was a quarter miler and ran in the mile relay. But I also had visited my older brother there. And I had sat in on classes. And what I sensed there was that this was, for all practical purposes, a residential liberal arts institution. The faculty there came to teach first and foremost, were absolutely determined to engage students in thinking through what it was they wanted to do with their lives. And that old notion about come by for coffee and cookies, they did this all the time. And so I was nurtured in this place and took hold in the discipline of English, 19th and 20th century literature. And I was especially taken by Henry David Thoreau and civil disobedience. And so as I was reading and thinking of course I reached the conclusion most of you would reach. It was time to write the great American novel. <laughs> so I set out to hitchhike across the country between my junior and my senior year. And I took with me to Tocqueville. I took with me on the road with Jack Kerouac. I took with me a relatively new piece by John Steinbeck called Travels with Charlie, which was both one of the most simply written and profoundly thought through pieces. And at the 11th hour, a colleague said to me, you need to take along a book called The Other America by Michael Harrington. That book, along with Thoreau, changed my life. I started out my hitchhiking. I was looking at the landscape, I was enjoying the freedom, and what I discovered was that the world bore virtually no resemblance to the world in which I grew up. Everywhere I looked, there were pockets of poverty. There was discrimination. There were people without decent housing. There was rampant unemployment. There were laws, de jure and de facto, meant to repress people. And I'm reading The Other America because that is the story that Michael Harrington was telling. A story, by the way, that captured John F. Kennedy and persuaded him that he needed to move dramatically, at least on the issue of voting rights for African Americans. And so I'm on the road, and I'm reading, and I'm talking to people, and I'm, I'm watching. And what I discovered is that I needed to relearn the way the world worked. I needed to take those liberal arts assumptions and put them to work in a fresh way. I needed really to think critically yet one more time, to work with people in a collaborative way it would help me understand how this world was so different than the world in which I grew up. To try to find, if you will, the levers of power that might make it possible for people to have some version of the experience that I had. To have, in a phrase, the life chances I had, home, safety, full employment, family intact. This, it seemed to me, was a noble piece of work. But what was so clear to me is that I was not equipped to think those things through and act those things through unless I returned to the curriculum and began to see if this is the problem, poverty and discrimination and violence, then how am I going to learn through the curriculum, with history, with political science, with economics, the way in which I might be able to respond? Turned out I was 
by a fluke vote, elected the student body president. And I proposed that we begin to focus the resources of the university on the local community, on rural farm hands, on people without education, and to start to mobilize students around this issue of changing their life chances so they would have greater life choices. It was so clear to me that I was one of the fortunate sons and daughters. And the question was how, as my father used to say, to plant your foot and push in a way that would alter the circumstances of these people's lives. So I'm now viewing the world in a quite different way my senior year. We're working in the community. We're thinking about the curriculum in a different way. And I'm watching Martin Luther King, and I'm watching the Civil Rights Movement. And I'm watching what's happening in the state of Alabama at a place called the Pettus Bridge in Selma. And for those not as long in the tooth as I, or as gray in the muzzle, Selma was this great moment of confrontation between those peaceful, nonviolent protesters who said, we want the vote. Dogs were turned loose, water cannons, even the Alabama National Guard refused to protect these people. And so a call went out for people to come down to Selma and join a march from Selma to Montgomery from March 21 to March 25. And a group of my colleagues and friends and faculty members passed a hat. And they said to me, you go. You be there. You carry the flag. So I went. There was something so profound about the courage of these people, about the suffering, about their determination, about their nonviolence. And now I saw Henry David Thoreau's civil disobedience, Mahatma Gandhi's passive resistance coming into a movement that would change America. And so I joined the 3,100 marchers for this 50-mile march. We were four nights in a row stopping, staying at churches, having three times evacuating the churches because of bomb threats. But I was introduced to an extraordinarily new way to learn. It was called a teach-in. And what Martin Luther King did was to talk about nonviolent resistance and the power of truth and the willingness to be arrested. If, in fact, the law were illegal, you would stand and be arrested and you would protest it. And a future mentor of mine, William Sloan Coffin, who was a, perhaps one of the leading individuals in the early 60s opposing, first of all, segregation. He was part of Freedom Rides and then he came out to oppose the war. He talked about the power of the church. And then there were lectures, as it were, about the political and the economic and the social underpinnings, the world in which these persons who were denied the vote were living. It was just an extraordinary new way of understanding, if you will, the liberal arts. How do you think critically? How do you do so in a collective way? How do you learn to act as you begin to say, what does this knowledge mean for me in relationship to my family, to my friends, to my community, to my country? And how is it we can make some change? How is it we can begin one more time to think about changing life chances to increase life choices? So by the time the 3100 got 
to Montgomery. Uh, there were 25,000 of us. Cain gave a powerful uh, speech. George Wallace stood in the doorway. And it was evident that there was this collision course, which my sense was, was going to be won ultimately by those people who saw clearly the right and good and democratic and fair thing to do. And several days later, the President of the United States, Lyndon Johnson, said, we must pass uh, the, the Voting Rights Act and use the famous phrase, we shall overcome. So it was a transformative moment, learning in a way quite different, direct action. So I came back to campus. I had submitted an application as a Fulbrighter. And I wanted to go to India, and I wanted to spend time studying the impact of Henry David Thoreau and civil disobedience on Mahatma Gandhi. But having been where I was from Selma to Montgomery, I thought this is much more than just a kind of academic discursus. I really need to understand how it is that Gandhi changed a nation. What were the underlying concepts which persuaded him that you could transform the beliefs and the actions of people living in the villages and living in the cities in such a way that they could win their own freedom and their own nationhood. And the Fulbright people surprised me. When I said this is what I want to do, they said not only is that a good idea, that's an excellent idea, and we're going to write a letter of introduction. And you can visit any of Gandhi's senior disciples anywhere in India. And I said, I have one more request. I said, I'd like to live in Gandhi's ashram for a period of time. They looked at me quite quizzically and they said, we think we can arrange that. And so I went to India and I began to interview, to spend time with, to go into the ashram to see what the daily rituals of life were. But I also was teaching in a small college in a town called Sardar Vallabhai Vidipith Vallabhijanagar. <laughs> and what I learned there was that the students had so much to teach me about how they had said Gandhi is the model and he is that person who is showing us the direction to go and how difficult it is to live the kind of disciplined life that Gandhi asked for, mostly around nonviolence. And so that time in India was extraordinarily informative to me, yet one more time, thinking, now let's see, the liberal arts says, think critically, learn collaboratively, identify the resources in such a way uh, that they will help you elevate your life and solve problems that you believe are important. So I, I'm in the village and I get a letter. And by the way, it's pretty unusual to get a letter in India because if the stamp on it has not been canceled, they take the stamp off. It's very valuable and it's worth several days worth of work for the mailman. So it had been canceled and I got it and it was this this nomination to go to a divinity school. And I thought, this is, they don't know me. <laughs> and the deal about the Rockefeller Fellowship was you could not have applied to a divinity school. But they were saying, it is important that you go for at least a year to understand the power and the role of religion in America and the ways in which it affects us knowingly and unknowingly. And the deal would be, you could pick which divinity school you wanted to attend. And I thought, oh, this, is, this is not right. And I put the garbage out and five days passed and it was the village. And so I went back out and I got the letter. <laughs> so one of the habits that I developed was, I might as well just say straight up what I planned so that you won't be surprised and you can say no or you could say yes, just as I did about going to India. I really wanted to live in the ashram. I wanted that discipline. Now I wrote and I said, I know where I'd go to school. I want to go to Yale Divinity School. 
Why? Because William Sloan Coffin is there, and he is probably the single most articulate person who has been involved in a protest movement about injustice, who cares deeply about cities burning, who's fighting for those who are low income and bypassed. So I said, I want to go to Yale Divinity School. I said, but there's a second reason. I want to go because Yale is in New Haven. And New Haven has something called the Model City Program. It was a really courageous, inventive notion by a young mayor at the time, Richard C. Lee, in which he said, if we can get state and federal and foundation and Yale money, we can begin to realign the way in which the city of New Haven works. Life chances, life choices. And so I said, if I go, I want to be part of that model city effort. So I also want to cross and enroll in the School of Art and Architecture because that's where the urban studies program is. Maybe the city is that setting where you can alter the way in which chances and choices are created. And so one thing I knew I was going to leave behind when I left India was a group of friends who were Peace Corps volunteers several villages away. And the Peace Corps had built what was called the Peace Corps Book Locker. It was 500 books, the canon, East and West, history, psychology, sociology, great literature. And what we would do is take three or four books, each of us, read them, and then we'd come back together and the concept was called Each One, Teach One. And this became a kind of floating seminar. Yet one more time, a way to think differently about the classical classroom, but utilizing the resources of books. And so we bid farewell to one another, and we've seen each other since. And each of us has said, perhaps we learn more about Freud and Marx uh, and Shakespeare during those conversations than maybe we learned in the classroom, but we thought in a different way about it. So to cut the chase in New Haven, it became a quite remarkable setting because the war was in Vietnam was bubbling up, because the cities were precarious in whether they were going to explode. And I and several others said, I need to think about this using the resources of the university, but I don't see any classes that exactly help me. And as I was saying to Elizabeth a little earlier today, so we banded together and decided to have a three-day teach-in at Yale. And we proposed to close all the classes down in order to open the university up, in order to focus on these great questions of war, of poverty, of peace, of the economy. And I did have a, one in a series of conversations with the then President Kingman Brewster, in which I said, I think it would be a great idea if the university would say, well, let's do this. We'll just shut down. And his initial response is, what? <laughs> shut the university down in order to have these teach-ins? And I said, well, give it some thought because here's what I'm pretty certain of, and I showed him the list of all the faculty members who were going to teach, and people from the community who were going to teach. I thought he did one of the smartest things ever. He declared a moratorium on classes so that we could participate as a community in this kind of teach-in model. And he came, and he taught, and I thought it was one of the most powerful examples of how a president can influence his or her campus. So we were in the midst of that, and we concluded this was a pretty powerful thing. Is it possible to continue it? So the bottom line is we created the free school in New Haven, where community people and university people could take these kinds of courses both outside the curriculum but also in concert with it. Of course, I did what my father said don't do. I got involved in politics because the city was trying to put a freeway through my back door. 
And so I ran for the city council, as did six others. We came to be known as the Magnificent Seven. I'll tell you what, the political machine in New Haven didn't think we were so magnificent, but we all got elected, and we began a series of teach-ins about the city using liberal arts concepts. And in the end, uh, I suggested as a city councilman that we ought to create a position called the chief administrative officer who could focus, this is now the shorthand for it, how to change the life chances of people in the city, to give them the life choices. And a few years went by and I finished my PhD and was back in New Haven and the mayor called me and said, look, wise guy, you proposed this position. Are you willing to take this assignment? And there are lots of other stories I could tell you. Um, I did start to tell them. I'll simply say he had been the police chief and he had wiretapped me. But he had also wiretapped Kingman Brewster and Senator Lieberman. And it was that kind of a time. And so I needed to be clear if I were going to be his deputy mayor, that there would be a faithful relationship between the two of us. He persuaded me and allowed us to begin to build into the neighborhoods 221D3 housing, what a wonderful concept. A school where my wife taught, which would open at 6 in the morning and close at midnight. Daycare, the elderly, a city center, a place for people to be tutored and mentored. It was a spectacular idea. And so I thought this was a pretty impressive time to be learning in the model city and learning about major social movements. And while I'm in the middle of this, a friend and his wife, both of whom went to Ohio Wesleyan, simply said they had nominated me for the presidency. And I said, gosh, I'm, I'm really sorry you wasted the time. They're not going to bother when they look at my resume. Short and the long was, they said, well, we'd like to talk in same notion. Let me tell you what I would do if I come. And here's what I said. I cannot think of a more powerful place than a residential liberal arts college in which the individuals and the institution can make powerful and dramatic changes in their lives, in the community around them, and in the greater world. And this is what I would propose, I said. We would build a meta curriculum, very simply. What we would do is pick a set of issues, and those issues would both draw from the curriculum as we know it, but faculty would create seminars to address that question specifically. So questions around poverty, questions around nuclear war, questions around the economics of a small farmland people in the state of Ohio. Questions that were on the minds of students and faculty. And I said, here's how I would propose we learn it. If the students will invite me to live with them, I will move in for 100 days in 10 different places. And at 10 o'clock every night, we'll have pizza and flat Pepsi. And we'll begin to ask this question. What is the issue most central in your life? What matters most to you? And how do you think this curriculum and this college can help you think that through? And the faculty got a little nervous and came to my office after 10 or 11 days and said, you know, exactly what's going on. I said, why don't you come on up? Most faculty hadn't darkened the doorway of a dorm. I was living in the women's house and in the house of black culture and a fraternity and a sorority. And so they came up and they joined the conversation. And out of that, here was what the first year looked like. Life and death in the nuclear age. Once a week, every Monday, the entire community gathered. It used to be the old chapel, but it had fallen on hard times. The entire community the building and grounds people, the technicians, the faculty, the students, were all invited and we would bring speakers from around the country, if not the world, to address this question. And we would do so once a week. The faculty had met over the summer. 
and had designed courses which they thought were really appropriate for this life and death in the nuclear age. The physics of the bomb, the consequence epidemiologically if it were dropped, the literature around, if you will, apocalypse, the ways in which the nursing community could think about this. Well, bottom line is, we put it together. Students could enroll for the coin of the realm, credit. But here was the responsibility at the end of the semester. Each student had to answer the following. What do I believe? Why do I believe it? Where do I stand? Why do I stand there? And what will I do? Borrowing from experience in previous times and places, we shut the college down for two days and students, in effect, presented these projects. But they got to choose the medium. Would it be a poem? Would it be a dance? Would it be an essay? Would it be a film? Would it be a particular project, as is the case with the nursing school, which said, what happens if Columbus, Ohio, 23 miles away, is ground zero? What will the consequences be for life? And for two days, we taught each other, each one teaching one another about what we had learned. And then there were actions to be taken as a result of that. And the, came to be known as the NC, the National Colloquium. And every year, the students and the faculty and I would meet to say, what do we think the theme is? Can we create some seminars? Who will the speakers be? Just by way of example, when we talked about life and death in the nuclear age, we brought the captain of the, uh, of the Enola Gay who dropped the bomb on Hiroshima. He spoke. We brought four survivors from Hiroshima. They spoke. We brought John Hershey, the great novelist who wrote the work Hiroshima, and we distributed it to every student, every faculty member, any townsperson, so that we could have this kind of common conversation. And we brought physicists, and we brought lawyers, and we brought uh, ethicists. It was a pretty rich and powerful every Monday at noon conversation in these sem seminars. I just say that to say each time, it seems, there's a way to stop and ask the question, how do I think afresh in a critical way? How do I utilize whatever resources they are here so that I can understand more about myself, my relationship to my friends, to this community, and to this country? And so after a decade uh, there, the 92 election came, and the very simple fact is many of the people who were involved in Bill Clinton's campaign had also been in New Haven during this period of time, and I simply thought, a lot of things were going to happen in Washington, and I wanted to see whether federal policy could be used one more time to think about life chances and life choices. You know, quite like yours. To think critically, uh, to, to, to live loyally, to engage in the great issues of your time. Uh, that's a paraphrase of it, but that's what this place is about, and it gives you a chance to think it through, especially at a moment when American higher education is being challenged by the integrity, the power, the importance of places like this. And I think, I have some opinions about what you can do. I think you have global potential to address questions that women can seize upon, be prepared to act and lead and make a huge difference in their own lives, the lives of their community, and those about them. So in the end, I am a child of the Manhattan Project. I went back for my 50th year reunion. One third of my class, having gone away, came back to live in that community again. But I, I'm here to say, as an ending, that for the first time we had an opportunity to talk about the dark side of what does it mean to be in a utopian community that builds a bomb that's dropped. For the first time ever, ever, my class got on a bus and went out and saw the very reactor where our parents worked. That was powerful. And we had our own teaching.
So I urge you to seize upon your own institution's motto and do the things that will make such a profound difference in the life chances and the life choices of people. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, David. That was absolutely extraordinary. And I loved that you ended on our mission statement because I was, as I was listening to you, I thought this is a life's profession of a life committed to thinking deeply, to living honorably, to engaging the intellectual and social challenges of your time, a life committed as we are committed to teaching and teaching in. <laughs> And uh, you have given us so much to think about, and this was a great gift. Thank you. And so now it's my pleasure, having heard from a, a life of liberal learning and teaching, uh, from a seasoned life of liberal learning and teaching, to hear from two members of our sophomore class, uh, the great class of 2014, who will offer their own reflections on the Agnes Scott experience. I'm going to invite Amina Hussein and Ashley Laurie forward. Amina comes from Augusta, Georgia. She's president of the class, co-president of the Muslim Student Association. She's a religious studies and pre-med student. And Ashley is a history major born in New York City, uh, the other Manhattan, I guess, and, and uh, grew up in Georgetown and in Guyana, South America. So uh, Amina and then Ashley. Good afternoon. Hello. Good afternoon. Um, when I asked the sophomore class what did they think Agnes Scott meant to them, the five most commonly used words were knowledge, opportunity, community, education, and power. When I began thinking about these three words over and over again, I began to realize that these words define and set Agnes Scott apart from other colleges and separates us Scotties away, away from other graduates. Agnes Scott thrives on excellence. It's full of talented professors and incredible people that will change your world. By providing the students with ample resources, such as the Science Learning Center and Math Lab, to compassionate professors, Agnes Scott takes in a young girl and within four years morphs her into a force to be reckoned with. People feel safe to constantly recreate themselves and to try new things. College really truly is a time for a person to find themselves. I can't wait for the opportunity to walk out of Agnes with my black ring on my finger, a diploma in my hand, and the knowledge I've gained from these hallowed halls, proud of the woman I've become. When I personally began to think about what Agnes Scott College means to me, I feel that Agnes Scott is a community full of rich tradition and warm people. If anyone needs help from another Scotty sister to the professors to the lovely women in Evans and Molly's, Everyone is willing to bend over backwards to help you mentally, physically, emotionally, and all the other LEs possible. <laughs> For me, Agnes Scott is more than just a college. It's a support system. I don't know what I would have done this past year through the hardships and the health issues I faced without the lovely people I'm so happy to call my family. Tomorrow, I will officially be a member of this glorious family, and I honestly cannot wait to join this exclusive club known as the Black Ring Mafia. <laughs> woo woo! Thank you. <laughs> Good afternoon. In honor of Founders Day Convocation, it is important for us to all reflect on the college as an institution. What exactly is Agnes Scott College all about? What does it mean to be a part of the college, whether as a faculty, staff member, or as a student? How has Agnes Scott evolved and what does it offer the world in the 21st century? 
1816, a young woman named Agnes Irvine Scott left her home in Ireland at 17 years of age, at around much the same age that we do in search of a new life. It seems like just yesterday I was walking onto this campus as a first year, filled with all the emotions it is possible to feel all at once. Anxiety, zeal, confusion, clarity, hesitancy, and readiness. I was eager to enter the classroom and start learning. Little did I know that I was to learn in ways I had never imagined and in places I had never imagined. Within a few short weeks, I realized that I was learning academically, yes, but more so about myself and a whole brave new world. I learned in the classrooms, in professors' offices, in the dorms, and sitting at lunch in Evan's Dining Hall or Molly's Cafe. I was learning to be brave. I was learning to be a leader. It is at times like those that I especially came to value a liberal arts education. The values of such an education reflect some of those of the college. To challenge yourself, to never confine yourself to one discipline, but to learn to, as we say, think deeply, live honorably, and engage the intellectual and social challenges of our times. Learning a little from all disciplines of life plays an integral role in such a process. It aids us to go like my elementary school motto stated, onward, upward, and reach for the stars. You are able to have an effective conversation anywhere, at any time, on almost any topic, because knowledge is never wasted. But beyond learning, what else is Agnes Scott about? Well, simply put, you know you're in a good place when a professor tells you that your first college paper was not thorough enough because you had not expressed how you felt and your opinions on the topic, when a professor stresses that your thoughts are important to her. You know you're in a good place when everyone in your first year seminar is in tears because it has come to an end. You know you're in a good place when you attend dialogues and club meetings, etc., and everyone bonds by relaying some of their worst experiences so that others may learn from them and that we may share each other's burdens and pain. You know you're in a good place when you trick your unsuc <laughs> unsuspecting and newly engaged friend into coming over to the alumni pond and then throwing her into the freezing water, but also waiting sweetly with towels for her to emerge. You know you're in a good place when you're experiencing a faculty-led study abroad trip all the way across the globe, but in the end you feel that instead you were in a trip with your sisters and parents. Such precious moments also cause me to reflect on the traditions of this 123-year year institution. With every experience from pancake jams to trips to yoga tap before finals, the one of course closest to the hearts of us sophomores presently is tomorrow evening when we will put on those rings. When we do, we will become a part of the fondly regarded Black Ring Mafia. It is a day we have waited for since receiving that letter in the mail saying congratulations, we are pleased to inform you that you have been accepted to Agnes Scott College's class of 2014. It won't be about merely adding another accessory to our being, but rather joining a fabric of young women and experiences that span decades. And when one day after I would have graduated, and maybe even living in some country far across the globe, I'll see a young woman with that onyx stone ring on her finger, and I'll know that once upon a time, she too danced that black cat and spring fling, and that she too ran in her pajamas from her dorm to Alston because of that fire alarm drill at five in the morning. <laughs> I'll know that she's a member of the family. So in closing, that really is what Agnes Scott College has to offer the world in the 21st century. It takes young women, and in some cases girls, because some of us enter as girls, and it makes us women. Women ready to brave the storm in a harsh but beautiful world. When I was asked the other day to reflect on the top 10 things that I love most about Agnes Scott, my honest and heartfelt response was, the professors, the students, the staff who work endlessly to ensure that we are well fed and that our living areas are comfortable as they can be. This beautiful campus, the opportunities from internships to study abroad, the events such as this one, for the city of Decatur, for the friendships made, for the Facebook statuses that let you know that your neighbor is having a hard time writing that paper just like you are. And last but certainly not least, I am grateful for the tears and the laughter. Thank you.